So I work with both vegetable crops, um, snap beans, tomatoes, white potatoes, and also traditional row crops like corn, soybeans, and wheat. I work on the whole system and basically specialize on coastal plain soils, you know, sandy loam, loamy sands. So this is what I'll be presenting today is, is trying to figure out as far as phosphorus. One, I want to try to answer your question on why in the world in the Virginia Cooperative Extension and Mid-Atlantic Vegetable Guides, we're still recommending phosphorus for some of these vegetable crops if you're testing very high for soil test phosphorus. Uh, we have some nice data sets, a lot of experiences shared with us to show you why this is needed, but also I'll demonstrate hopefully you know, over time we still are drawing these soils down, drawing down some of these legacy phosphorus concentrations without hurting our vegetable crops. So that's where we're, where we're going today. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the overall issue, some more generic soil testing theory and how maybe that theory might need to be revised or skewed a little bit for vegetable crops here on Delmarva. We'll talk specifically about some fresh market tomato and white potatoes from some Delmarva data that we have. Talk about where fertilizer recommendations are now and explain again why you see some of the things you see. And then where we go from here. And a lot of this is still unknown. We're still writing grants, still trying to research why we're seeing this phenomena with vegetable crops compared to traditional row crops. Trying to document it, trying to make sure that we're doing our due diligence for uh, keeping yields high, keeping economics where they need to be. Also, of course, without uh, wasting our phosphorus nutrient. So that's what we're gonna do. And if, again, if you have any questions, just uh, ask me during the presentation. Certainly, um, I'm very open to that. So one of the main reasons I like to say that we're really trying to, to save phosphorus, reduce phosphorus applications, is because it is a very finite resource. Uh, depending on the literature, there's always, you know, you say a number, somebody's always gonna argue with you, that's just the way it is. But depending on a, a good, uh, some data that was shown by the International Plant Nutrition Institute, here in the United States of America, at our main reserve in Florida, this is the Bone Valley of Florida, you know, basically we're digging up ancient dead sea creatures. We have about 30 to 50 years of a, a the good vein left there of phosphorus. I still hope to be working in 30 to 50 years. So there's a good chance during my career, this supply might be depleted and we'll have to go look elsewhere for our phosphorus sources. If you look worldwide, again, depending on the number, I've seen this number anywhere to, from 100 to 300 years left, with most of this being international, like off the coast of Morocco in some different places. So phosphorus is a finite resource that we need to make sure we, we conserve just like you would oil or you know, some other uh, non-renewable energy. So that's one point to why we need to make sure we're taking care of our phosphorus. And of course, the other is due to the, the, the environmental climate that we're in right now. Uh, certainly, if you look at a lot of these maps that a lot of different people produce, different models, it's pretty clear that a lot of the loading is being attributed to agriculture here on Delmarva. Whether that's, you know, regardless of the source, phosphorus is seen as being a nutrient of concern. So we're always looking at ways to reduce phosphorus use if we can. But that's why I say if we can reduce it, not always can you reduce it without hurting yields. And of course, a lot of this is attributed to poultry. Uh, this is uh, my daughter. It's my favorite picture of my daughter. Uh, this is about two years ago. And she loves animals. And, and uh, my wife won't go into a chicken house with me. But my daughter is happy to go do research, scoop up poultry litter or whatever we need for a research project. Uh, we have some very good cooperators we work with. So of course, you know, historic applications of poultry litter on Delmarva is one reason we have a lot of phosphorus. It's one thing we're working with, one reason a lot of our phosphorus is being reduced. But also uh, because of historic vegetable production. If you talk to a lot of farmers, basically they'll say, you know, 80 years ago, what was the main fertilizer source that was used? 10, 10, 10, right? Still one of the more premier fertilizer sources here in America. So if you look at that, using that as your sole fertilizer source on, an, again, an end-based plan, just like we used to do with poultry litter, you can see why phosphorus is pretty high in a lot of our soils here on Delmarva. So with anything, with any nutrient, what we're really trying to figure out is, is this is my favorite slide as far as every presentation I promised I would show it is Liebig's Law of the Minimum, where we're trying to basically figure out what nutrient 
is most lacking in our soil system so we can patch that hole and take our yields to a new level. Now in this case, if your soil is the different slats, what's our most limiting nutrient? Nitrogen, which is typically the case, right? Uh, every crop pretty much except for soybeans, you're putting nitrogen out and some of y'all are putting nitrogen on soybeans. So you patch that hole, what is the most limiting nutrient then? Phosphorus, patch that, then what? This example is calcium, is that typical? No, just, I just wanna point that out there. But you know, potassium, sulfur, actually on Delmarva, I should make a new example for me where sulfur is somewhere down here, where sulfur is typically one of the more limiting nutrients now. Uh, this is again from a 30 year old textbook. This is old soil science theory. So we're always trying to figure out what nutrient, which hole to patch. And where this really comes into play is when you're talking about soil testing for so many of these nutrients, you know, where do vegetables play in this whole picture of soil testing theory? Because they are a little bit different. So this is uh, some Virginia, I'm from Virginia, everything I, I basically am gonna present is based on Malik 1, which you know there's different extractors, Malik 1, Malik 3, Bray. In Virginia, we do Malik 1, uh, soil testing extract for phosphorus and potassium. And so is the data I'll be showing, a lot of the axis will be in Malik 1, phosphorus is PPM. So using basically this range right here where you get from zero to 55 plus. Basically anything higher than 55 part per million malic one extractable phosphorus, we're considering very high. And typically we don't recommend any further nutrient applications as far as phosphorus. Now for those of y'all in the malic world, if you know your malic charts, it's basically just double more or less of malic one. So you know, more or less 110 is very high for malic three. Again, it depends on soils, a bunch of different factors, but if you're, if you're in that world, that's what you can think about. So when you're looking at general soil science theory, looking at below optimum, optimum, or above optimum soil test, below optimum being very low, low, or medium, the idea is, of course, you will see a significant yield loss if you don't put out fertilizer. So if you do put out fertilizer on a low test in soil, you will see a huge yield jump, you know, 80% of the time. If you're high, so this is what this chart means, fertilizer rate. Nutrient applied, below optimum, you put out fertilizer for that crop and more to build your soil up. And these two charts go together. If you're high, you won't see a yield response, but we still recommend fertilizer <coughs> because we want you to maintain and basically put out what you're removing to keep your soil at an even keel to avoid big fertilizer bills. And if you're very high, you could cause yield loss depending on the nutrient, but we want you to draw down your soil because there's no point in wasting money. So this is the generic soil testing theory we use, right? Now, how do you think this might be different in my mind for vegetable crops? Any idea? Or do you think it's the same? No. It's not the same, because if it was the same, I wouldn't be here talking, right? <laughs> so, so when you're looking at some of this theory, it, it, this is what, I, I don't know exactly how to draw these curves. This is just kind of thinking about the projects, the data we have, what I visually think it may look like. Certainly with like potatoes and tomatoes, we say if you're testing high, you know, somewhere between uh, you know, 18 and 55 or so, soil tests may like one extractable phosphorus. Generically, we would say no yield response, but from the data I've seen, there's a very good chance you're gonna still increase yields up to a certain point. I don't know what that point is. We don't have enough correlation calibration data to say what that point is. So this chart would look different because we're saying, okay, hey, basically you need to put out some fertilizer way out into this above optimum, what we consider range, because you're still seeing yield responses. So our fertilizers may certainly, uh, recommendations would be different for vegetables versus row crops. And I, like I said, I don't know where this line would be. I'm, I'm assuming peat saturation would be a good point. You know, at some point your soil can no longer hold phosphorus. It's going to leach out like nitrate, like sulfur. There, there's a point there uh, that depends on the specific soil. But you know, where do we draw this line? I don't know. Uh, that's, that's a Amy Schober, Gripal Tour, and myself write these grants all the time trying to receive money to figure this question out. So if you're on one of them grant panels, keep that in mind. Or if we call and ask you for a letter of recommendation, this is what we're talking about, um, a reference letter. Because when you're looking at the phosphorus cycle, I mean, there's just a lot of different inputs, right? There's animal sources, biosolids, plant residues, 
Uh, typically, we think fertilizer, you know, poultry litter, wh whatever the source is. It basically all gets incorporated into organic matter or is in what we call solution P, soluble P, or it's adsorbed or desorbed into secondary minerals. And so the way these reactions work affects solubility, affects how much phosphorus is leached, affects how much is taken up. And certainly with different crop systems, they're different. So what we're trying to figure out for vegetable crops is, is how is a potato system different than a corn system, or how is a tomato system different than a soybean system and whatnot. Like what specifically is being impacted here that's changing this phosphorus solubility? And of course, we thought about the typical things, temperature, you know, but we're still trying to figure out that's not the entire answer from what we've seen. So when you're looking at some of this data, just uh, this is some, some data from Delaware, uh, from Dr. Sims from uh, many moons ago, but still very pertinent. It's basically looking at malic 1 soil test phosphorus concentrations in PPM on this x-axis versus soluble P on the y-axis. And there's a pretty clear correlation, right? The higher your soil test P, the more soluble P. That makes sense. So basically, if you have some soils out here, like this soil, it's got more phosphorus in solution that can leach out, run off, or be taken up by a plant than one of the samples down here. But what's something else that's kind of unique about this graph? There's, there's two kind of unique things. One is looking at some of these sites. Not all sites, just because you have a higher soil test, this male is extracting something that's not then water soluble. That's kind of unique, right? Theoretically, you might have 800 ppm melee one extractable and not have a whole lot more water extractable, meaning the plant can't take it up. So what's causing that? That's one question. But also looking at this optimum soil test range where most crops don't really see a benefit to more fertilizer, you know, are we going to change a whole lot if we do add a little more phosphorus to a vegetable system? Because we're really not changing soluble P a whole lot, but we certainly are seeing yield responses that can economically be a big difference for these crops. That's kind of the other take home from this particular graph. So specifically, again, looking at Virginia, I said, well, you know, what is the, what, how many soils am I talking about here? Well, I'm talking about making a recommendation for a very high soil test P soil. So this is statewide, looking at very high for all our different crops from our Malik 1 soil test. Basically, 46% of of the samples that came in for potatoes, we're going to test very high. And about 39%, again, that's statewide. But more specifically, looking at the Eastern Shore, we have commercial production where 95% you know, of our vegetable crops are grown. Accomack County had about 59% of our soil samples tested very high, and about 70% in Northampton. So this leads to the question, okay, basically, if we, if we just say, okay, very high, no soil test recommendations, no soil uh, phosphorus can be applied, there's a good chance we're going to hurt tomato and potato yields. So we've really got to make sure we have this data right that we know what we're doing. So we put out some different studies, um, and I also have some data here from uh, Delaware as well, on our typical eastern shore Bojack sandy loam soil. This is uh, probably 90% of the soil series in my two counties on the shore here. The upper six inches is sandy loam, loamy sand. Uh, typically a hard pan between 10 to 12 inches, somewhere in there, that might be root restrictive, depending on the cropping system. And then you have a, basically this Bojack loamy sand or sandy loam texture, which is about 65% sand, 15% uh, clay or so, somewhere in that range. Down to 16 to 18 inches where we have a clay layer. And then below that, basically, we're pure sand, 100% unconsolidated parent material, just a sandbar. And so this is a typical system. And looking at our pretty typical phosphorus concentrations, uh, at least on the research station and some other fields we've looked at, you know, 0 to 6 inches were very high, or 188 ppm phosphorus. 237 ppm are very high for 6 to 12 inches. And then you start decreasing, as you would expect. As you're, uh, basically, you're not plowing this deep nutrients are scavenging. And also, the pHs are typically lower down here. At 5.3, less phosphorus is extractable and available than at you know, higher pHs. So a pretty typical system. Uh, the other thing I like to point out on this chart is, is sulfur. Why do I like to talk about sulfur? This is a phosphorus talk, but 
to me, sulfur is one of the most important nutrients right now, especially in these systems where you know, we're talking like 8 ppm, 10 ppm, 6 to 12 inches, 29 ppm, and then 43 ppm. You know, what's happening to that sulfur? It's leaching. So if you're a consultant telling a farmer what to do, please don't put all your sulfur down in the fall for a, a wheat. You know, make sure you split apply it. Or for a vegetable crop, make sure you're putting enough out there. Because a vegetable crop, if 90% of the roots are in this top 10 to 12 inches, you know, we're talking basically, you might have, on this example, 15 to 20 to 25 pounds of sulfur there. A typical crop generally needs 30 pounds of sulfur for optimum production, if it's all available. So even in this example where, you know, I've been putting sulfur out on our projects, we're still pretty limiting. Because that sulfur is going to leach until you get down here deep. And especially in vegetable crops, these roots are not going to scavenge down two feet like a corn plant would. So just be cognizant of that um, for sulfur. But anyway, back to phosphorus. So the examples I'm talking about also are, are, are more specifically for commercial production, using plastic mulch for fresh market tomatoes. And for those of y'all not familiar with that system, basically you go uh, form your beds, put some fertilizer, mix it into the bed. We call that a cold mix. <coughs> And then you come back and put a band on the top of the bed, which we call a hot mix, which is slowly dissolved by the water over time. You come back, cover it with plastic and your drip tape for your irrigation and uh, uh, fertilizer injections, fertigation. And then we use the Florida weave for putting in stakes and, and weaving that tomato as you know, the plant progresses. So, and then fertilizer is injected to that drip line. So that's a pretty typical system. And that's what I'm really specifically talking about with these uh, recommendations. And just to kind of give you a side view, we have our black plastic mulch here. Again, in the spring, black plastic, raising that temperature because it's keeping that sun, increasing phosphorus solubility. Fertilizer mixed into the bed. And in this example was a 6 3 2, 6% 6 nitrogen, 3% phosphate, 12% potash. You know, basically made for that specific field. And then the surface. Uh, Drip irrigation on the surface and the surface band was 11417 analysis. Again, specifically for that field. So this is the system I'm talking about. And what we wanted to do was initially, with all the poultry on the shore, I'm, I'm involved in a minority energy initiative where we're using poultry litter as an energy source because one ton of poultry litter is worth about 60 gallons of propane for eating a chicken house. So the idea was we could take that poultry litter, heat a poultry house, and then what you get is a nutrient-rich ash that's six to seven times the phosphorus is poultry litter. So now, what's, why is that good? One, we can ship it away, right? Maybe. It's six to seven times, you know, 20% phosphate versus 3% phosphate. We can ship it further based on the nutrient concentration. But how much poultry litter do you think is put under plastic on the shore? None, right? So I'm looking at an alternative fertilizer source that we could get locally to use for vegetable crops instead of, uh, since you can't use fresh poultry litter. So that's what we were looking at on this particular study. Now you see from this, uh, it's a pain to work with. It's real dusty, it's like baby powder, it blows. This was a no wind day and you still see, it's so fine, any kind of wind current at all can carry it away. So that's one thing we're working on, but specifically I said, okay, let's look at this for a phosphorus perspective, potassium perspective, and a sulfur perspective. It's the three main nutrients that are in this material which is why I had it on the station. This was really a potassium study because I typically would not put a phosphorus study on a very high soil test phosphorus, right? That just, that's not what you do with a soil fertility specialist. But we said, let's do it anyway because we're looking at potassium. But for phosphorus, the rates we ended up putting out were 0, 40, 80, and 120 pounds of phosphate per acre. It's fresh poultry litter, uh, two different ashes, a biochar and then compared it to triple superphosphate, which is basically 100% water soluble, kind of as our gold standard. Because what we were, were really testing was whether this ash was available in our systems after you inject this poultry litter into a thousand degree furnace. That was the main question. So we had our triple super there, assuming that was basically 100% available. So do you think we saw a yield response to phosphorus? Right, again, that's why I'm talking today. So. <laughs> So uh, overall, looking at yield, which it wasn't a stellar yield year. I mean, we're talking 30, 40,000 pounds. Not bad, but not a terribly great yield. Again, on a very high 136 part per million malic one extractable phosphorus. So 
double what we would consider that cutoff range typically for row crops. Looking at our different sources here, no phosphorus yielded about 25,000 pounds per acre. And simply by, we balance nitrogen, we balance potassium, we balance, uh, well, just nitrogen and potassium in this study. You know, our different sources yielded different, ash is not quite as soluble. But looking at our gold standard here, triple superphosphate, we had over 40,000 pounds per acre. The only difference was phosphorus on a field that was 136 ppm phosphorus. Yes, sir. Well, this was averaged over the three rates. I'm sorry. Yeah, this was averaged over the, yeah, it was a main effect. So 40,000 pounds. So we saw a good phosphorus response. You know, so what does that mean economically? So taking triple superphosphate yield of 40,000 minus and off the 26,000 from no phosphorus, just assume they're all saleable, marketable. That's about 600 boxes, 625 pound boxes. Now, at a very bad time of year when you're only getting $10 a box. I know I talked to a farmer last week, a cooperator. He's getting $22 a box right now. So double this. Basically, by limiting phosphorus, we reduced that by at least $6,000 per acre. If it was last week, it would have been $12,000 per acre potential of loss just from limiting phosphorus, which is cheap. I mean, it's $0.50 cent a pound, right? So that was that one year. So now, of course, we're like, okay, wow, this is something we really didn't expect. That wasn't the intention of the study. So let's do it again <laughs> the next year. I went to a little bit higher field here, 175 part per million phosphorus. Same treatments, again, averaged over our P rates, uh, uh, 40, 80, and 120. To look at 80 is the average, I guess, is the way to look at that. Much higher yields here with controls, uh, no phosphorus, you know, around 58,000 pounds per acre. And triple super here, over 65,000 pounds per acre. So again, another phosphorus yield response. Now, what else is unique about this data, though? What yielded higher than triple super? Not statistically, though, but statistically, they're the same. But numerically, what's different? Poultry litter. So what does that mean? If I balance potassium, I balance nitrogen, phosphorus was I had something else limiting, right? I should probably have paid more attention to my sulfur, to my uh, zinc, um, manganese. I mean, uh, I need to go back and run this tissue test, actually, to try, try to figure this out. But anyway, poultry litter, that's one reason we like poultry litter as a fertilizer source, is you get a lot of micros that, depending on site year, might be very important, other than phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, and so forth. But regardless, we still did see a phosphorus response. So this year had better yields. Uh, the plants were healthier, you know, deeper roots, mine. But we still saw about 280 boxes more per acre, just by adding phosphorus. Again, ten dollars a box, you know, 2,800 bucks. If this was last week, five thousand dollars just by adding phosphorus. So that's a pretty big deal um, when you're talking about these high-value crops. So another study we worked on was looking at some <coughs> biochar. This was a couple years ago. You know, uh, companies were saying, what if we use biochar? So again, the intention was not looking at phosphorus. The intention was looking at biochar as an additive, uh, which ended up with some pretty high biochar rates. I'll show you the data here. But what I want you to look at on this graph, we have biochar rates at 0, 4, 8, and 12 tons per acre. But what I want you to pay attention to is this 50 pounds of phosphate per acre. That was using triple superphosphate as my standard and no phosphorus. So here's your direct comparison, phosphorus versus no phosphorus. Again, not a great year. This was actually a pretty bad year. Um, these were fall tomatoes. We kept spraying for disease. It was cool. But long story short, just phosphorus versus no phosphorus, we still saw about a 30% yield response, even in, even in a kind of a bad year. You know, I guess the roots were probably less aggressive. But uh, if you pencil that out, that's a pretty big again, economic benefit to this phosphorus. Now looking at biochar, just since we're talking about biochar a little bit, what happened to the biochar? Four tons yielded about the same as the phosphorus. Eight tons cut in half. What happened to that 12 ton biochar rate? Man, we killed that stuff. We saw injury, which is too great. Uh, some of the plants, I mean, a lot of plants just died. That was pretty interesting, but 
nonetheless, this was the software response on a 188 ppm phosphorus field. 243 box yield advantage or you know, 2,400 bucks at least. So that's the fresh market tomato side of things. Uh, some of the data we're seeing and some of the numbers we're crunching when we're talking about recommendations when we, when we get to that point. So now moving on to potatoes. Uh, this work, a lot of this question started before I came to Virginia Tech even in 2008. Uh, my predecessor was doing a lot of potato work as well as Gordon Johnson over in Delaware. And just time and time again, farmers were saying, look, we, we still are seeing responses at very high soil test phosphorus. So let's try to figure out why. How can we tell if a field is responsive or not? Is our ultimate goal, right? So, the, so uh, down in Virginia, we put out a bunch of different sites looking at some different scenarios. So basically in this particular project, it was over uh, two different years, you know, one, two, three, seven different sites looking at no phosphorus, 50 and 75 pounds of phosphate per acre that was broadcast applied because the farmer wanted to broadcast apply it and not mess with phosphorus or fertilizer in the planter under the seed piece. And then 25, 50, and 75 pounds put through the planter right under the seed piece. So if, if you're not familiar with that, basically the fertilizer drops down a little hoe, might mix it a little bit, the seed piece is dropped on top of that, and then you cover the row for that methodology. Again, it, the question was, why are we seeing it? How can we determine it on these very high soil test phosphorus concentrations? So like 242, 111, 279, 120, 111, 227, and 120, male one extractable phosphorus. Again, significantly greater than what you would expect to see a yield response. So looking at this, uh, we didn't always see a yield response. You know, this particular site, you had to have 75 pounds of phosphate under the tuber to see a response. Which tells you, hey, that plant was basically suffering until there was enough phosphorus concentration right under that row to increase yields. Early season growth, maybe. I mean, I don't know what the exact reason was. And this site, again, that high rate. Looking at this site here, on the lower spectrum of these soil test phosphorus concentrations, there was a 75, uh, there was a yield response when you put out 75 pounds of phosphate per acre, and then just 25 pounds gave you a yield response under the row. So, you know, some phosphorus did in fact increase yields. Again, it's not consistent. We don't have a good way because soil test is our, our default way to take a look at this. But, uh, Kind of crunching all those numbers together again to, just to visualize this, uh, picture the main effect, averaging all those treatments together. Just looking at P rates, on average, you know, 25 pounds of phosphate per acre, regardless of how it was applied, gave a yield bump over no phosphorus. And that yield bump, you know, we're looking at what, two, uh, probably 245 or so versus, you know, maybe 280 bags per acre. So pretty substantial and economically important yield response to more phosphorus. So now some work here from uh, Delaware from uh, Dr. Johnson. The first thing he said, well, let's try to figure out, okay, something's changing. Are we getting greater uptake? You know, phosphorus can be luxury consumed, uh, if I said that right, with, in the plant tissue. So basically the higher the soil test phosphorus concentration, the more phosphorus that plant can take up, the more that should be in the leaves or in the tubers. So he went around and did a, a lot of different sites and probably worked with a lot of y'all in this room. Do you think he found a good correlation between leaf tissue or tubers and soil test P? Meaning a soil test P increase, you saw more in the leaves and more in the tubers. I see some saying yes, some saying no. Well, uh, here's the bad news. It's not, not really, oops, not really. Uh, we're always looking for that, you know, golden, golden response to figure out how we can determine, you know, maybe we can do like a corn stalk nitrate test or something. Look at tubers. If you have high, you're less responsive. But regardless, it, it really was not a response. So it's basically for uh, leaf phosphorus, looking at the tissue concentration versus malic one extractable P here, it was a scatter plot, meaning no response. You can't look at your leaf tissue and tell if you're going to have a res response or not. Just you can't. Looking at tuber P, I mean, I always hate to say a weak correlation, but theoretically looking at this, uh, 
the tubers did have a little bit more P as that soil test P increase, meaning you're shipping more phosphorus off that ground if your phosphorus is higher, which is good for mining legacy P, but really in the big scheme of things, this relationship's not very strong. So we said, well, that's not the golden bullet. Let's, let's look at some other things. Let's just do some rate study. So uh, Gordon went out and on some uh, private farms and said, let's plant three varieties, Superior, Reba, and Gold Rush. There's some pretty uh, older but pretty common varieties nonetheless. At 060, 120, 180, and 240 pounds of phosphate per acre. Do you think he saw a, a response there for uh, yield or leaf tissue? Nope, not looking at rates. Looking at the rate main effect, again, leaf tissue didn't matter, yield didn't matter. But what this data was pretty interesting to take a look at, at the main effect for a variety, you know, rate specifically didn't matter, but variety did matter. Some of these varieties, like say uh, Goldbrush and Reba, appear to take up more phosphorus in the plant, but that did not translate over to yield. So again, it's not a good predictor but it does tell me that something different is going on with different varieties. So maybe Superior needs a recommendation. Gold Rush needs a recommendation. I mean, that's going to be a, you really can't do that, but, but certainly different plants are reacting different for the same crop, which is, uh, at least in that particular site year. So just looking at some more phosphorus rate study here, uh, this was, just looking at superior, we just said, well, variety might matter. Well, this is just superior at, what, a zero to 240 pounds per acre of phosphate. And this time, rate did pick up. Just basically one year later, different rain conditions, different temperatures. You know, something happened. Looking at leaf phosphorus concentrations, they were the same until you hit about 200 pounds of phosphate per acre, which is a lot of phosphorus on a high P ground anyway. But Looking at yield, you're looking at 253 bags for 120 pounds versus you know, 163 for 80. So basically, 120 pounds here gave the highest yield in this particular year for this particular field with Superior. Only 118 with uh, no phosphorus fertilizer. So it was a pretty large yield jump specifically as well. So then on this last study, we'll talk about, you know, up here in Delaware, or uh, was looking at Reba and, and just really trying to figure out what in the world's going on. Gordon put out no phosphorus, uh, 30 pounds of phosphate broadcast and incorporate it before planting using triple superphosphate, again, that gold standard. 100 pounds of phosphate and incorporated and then compared it to DAP um, and then some bands here as well. Again, leaf tissue, not a good predictor. But he did see some yield responses to some of these different treatments. Now, is there, again, a, a golden bullet here saying this is what you got to do? No. But we did see, again, a P response. 30 pounds of uh, phosphate applied at planting using triple super was 50 more bags per acre. Pretty good yield jump. 30 pounds using DAP, 374, and, and so forth. A couple of other responses here. So, again, something's going on you know, Spain and the Delmarva. So, so that's kind of the Delaware data. And so I'm, I'm repeating some of this down in Virginia. Uh, the main question for our farmers is, is can we broadcast or, or can we, do we still have to ban with our planter? That's the main concern. Uh, you know, everybody's just trying to get away from putting fertilizer out under that tuber with the planter. So it's just a simple study, you know, under the row, broadcast across the whole plot area and dist in. Uh, basically applied at a, uh, zero fertilizer, that's not phosphorus, that's zero fertilizer at all, and then 30, 60, and 90 pounds of phosphate per acre. And the long story short, the reason I did that was this was a smaller study put in after the fact with limited seed pieces. So that's why I didn't get the whole rate ramp in there. But nonetheless, I do have that 30, 60, and 90 comparison. And this was on a 108 ppm, very high test in soil there on the lower shore. So visually, between banded in the row and broadcast, uh, the plants are just blown over a little here. You know, really, you couldn't look at them and tell any difference. And then looking at the data, that basically mirrored that. Again, no fertilizer at all was about 9,000 pounds. 
but we had about 24,000 pounds broadcast and about 23,868 banded in the row. So no difference between broadcast versus banded. <coughs> but when you start looking at these phosphorus rates, again, we, we did happen to see a, a yield response. To 30 pounds, no, not necessarily between 30 and 60. But when you got those higher rates, 90 pounds, we saw our yield response. So it's just something to think about, something we need to figure out, you know, what's going on here with these crops where we're seeing that yield response when we really traditionally wouldn't. So the whole reason for all this is because I get a lot of questions asked, why are we still recommending phosphorus fertilizer for soils testing very high? So hopefully now you can say, okay, there's data out there from multiple states. So this is incorporated in our uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension recommendations specifically where we're looking at polyethylene, mulch, fresh market tomatoes. We're saying if your soil is very high, we're still recommending 50 pounds of phosphate per acre and 50 pounds of potash. Potash is the same kind of response. But we are putting a caveat on that saying, all right, we really don't have enough data to know where this cutoff is, but it's hard for us to believe you would see a yield response above 600 pounds per acre or 300 ppm, male like one. Because thinking back to that solubility diagram, we're saying, you know, I, I doubt you see a yield response out here, so I don't want you to put up more phosphorus. Again, I don't know that, I can't prove that, but on the data we've seen, we're limiting you at this 300 ppm mark. Past this, no more phosphorus. Lower than this, we're saying you're gonna probably still likely see a yield response on these high value vegetable crops. And if you look at this solubility diagram too, this is for traditional row crops, and just shifting it over a little bit even, it's, it's not changing the solubility a lot in the soil system. Just thinking about all the different ways that phosphorus is sorbed in there. So, uh, and, most, and frankly, most of our soils that are very high are, are right here. <laughs> so we don't have many soils you know, out testing that high for, in, in general. And the, uh, well, and here's the other part about this, because I also get asked a lot about, you know, well, I'll talk about that later. Same thing with white potatoes. White potatoes, 50 pounds of phosphate per acre is what we're recommending. Now, I'll put this box here. Uh, don't pay attention to that nitrogen. Um, pay attention to this, because I need to increase that. We have another publication we recommend for white potatoes. But, Basically what we're saying is, all right, if you're very high soil test P, we don't want you to lose basically $5,000 per acre. So we're recommending crop removal rates. So this is data from the International Plant Nutrition Institute looking at many different crops. Uh, here's white potatoes at 350 pounds uh, bags per acre, 350 hundred weight. You need 70 pounds of phosphate to be taken up in that plant to make that yield and you're, you're going to remove on average 53 pounds in your tubers. So if I'm saying put out 50 pounds and you have good yields, are you adding phosphorus to that soil overall? No, right? We're basically just putting out crop removal rates. So we're allowing you to put phosphorus out without hurting yields. Same thing with tomatoes. Now this is a pretty high, this is 80,000 pounds per acre, 40 tons. Uh, 87 pounds being taken up, 68 pounds removed. And we're saying 50, which is it's being moved off into fresh fruit. Again, crop removal rates. That's probably closer to our 60,000 pounds that we hope for here on the shore or so. But again, we're, we're recommending crop removal. Now, what's the good thing about vegetable crops for most farmers? Are, are they planting potatoes and tomatoes in the same field every year? No, some do, I know some do, but, but ideally I would tell you you're on a three year potato rotation. Again, ideally. So the other two years you're putting out corn or soybeans or wheat. And the good thing about that is corn, soybeans, or wheat don't see a yield response to very high soil test phosphorus concentrations. So if we're here with potatoes, we put out crop removal, our soil test stayed the same. The next two years you put out corn and wheat and soybeans, theoretically you don't need phosphorus fertilizer. So you are drawing down and removing a lot of that legacy phosphorus in our soil. So over time, over a three-year rotation, phosphorus concentration should go down, which is good for you know, thinking about solubility, Chesapeake Bay tributaries. 
But it's also good that we can say, well, okay, overall, we're really not increasing legacy P concentrations by still recommending phosphorus at these high levels in the rotation system over time. So another uh, point I wanted to bring up was uh, this 2016 Mid-Atlantic Commercial Vegetable Production Recommendations. Uh, basically, the 16 and the 2017 version are the same. Uh, we just changed the covers. Some states didn't even change the covers. Uh, the same recommendations with an addendum in 2017. In 2018, that's about to come out. That's a new version, so throw these away. But when you're looking at these, keep in mind that we're representing a pretty large geographic area. We're looking at uh, Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and New Jersey all have input to these recommendations. And so that's why in the guide you'll see, hey, in Virginia you can do this, in Delaware you can do this, in the different labels. But where this is really important for nutrients is, I know different states have different regulatory climates, of course. Uh, this is the Mid-Atlantic Guide, but this is why you'll see these footnotes. Always pay attention to footnotes. Don't just look at the zero and say, ah, oh, no fertilizer. This can give you more information that might be useful to you because what I say for fresh market tomato, very high soil test P levels, you can put out no phosphorus, but look at the footnote. Look at the footnote. I'm saying in Virginia, you can put out crop replacement values of 50 pounds of phosphate per acre. Now, that's, I'm a Virginia specialist, so I have the Virginia recommendations specifically put in here. So if you want other states put in here, talk to your fertility specialist for those states uh, with that. And the same with potash. There's a caveat here, too, 50 pounds of potash. Of course, nobody cares about potash because it doesn't pollute, so it just costs money. So uh, long story short, you know, hopefully you all have a better understanding now on, on one, why recommendations uh, still call for phosphorus if they're very high for some vegetable crops. And for the most part, we do for strawberries, watermelon, peppers, um, of course, tomatoes, potatoes. I have to think of the other main vegetable crops. I think they're the main, let's say, let's say watermelon, uh, we do. And there's a lot of different reasons why that we're still trying to frankly figure out. You know, the first person says, oh, it's because it's colder when you plant potatoes. Maybe, you're right, it's a little colder, less soluble uh, in the season, but that's not true for tomatoes. In tomatoes, we have that black plastic, we're heating our soil up, so that phosphorus is soluble. If you have fall tomatoes, you know, plant them in July, you know, even early uh, June, whatever, that phosphorus is soluble, so that coldness factor doesn't really play into it, it's not the answer. You know, what about soil pH? Again, potatoes. We recommend, officially in Virginia, still 5.2 to 5.5 for white potato production. You know, a lot of farmers raise their crops higher than that. Phosphorus is limiting when pH is low, so maybe that's the reason. But again, not with tomatoes. At 6.2 to 6.5, where you grow tomatoes, that's where phosphorus is the most soluble. I think a lot of it has to do with this uh, scavenging roots. You think about a uh, drip irrigated crop, most of those roots are around that drip irrigation in that bed, the top eight to 10 inches of the bed. But even, you know, potatoes, that roots in pretty confined space compared to the majority, especially if you have hard pans, but vegetable roots don't try to penetrate hard pans anyway, for the most part. So maybe that's the reason, but uh, we're still working on that. Like I said, uh, I'd be glad to talk with anybody after this uh, with experiences, uh, fields and whatnot. But just know that, you know, we do, Typically, I hate to put a number, you know, 50% of the time maybe do see a yield response that's economically viable on a lot of these vegetable crops uh, in these high soil test phosphorus concentrations. But also just learn from the past. If you didn't see a response, well, then that field has got something else going on that year. You might not need it. So there's a lot of things to think about. Soil testing is not a quantitative thing like we make it out to be. It's more of a qualitative uh, a, a tool. You know, it's not a numerically factual um, science. So anyway, uh, if you're interested in keeping up with my program, of course, we're on Facebook. I put a lot of information on here. I know some of y'all have been to my programs down in Virginia, you know, field days and whatnot. Uh, I put up, I try to write reports and put on there, you know, extension pubs uh, when I'm at my desk. If you're in Virginia also, just know we still have free soil testing and our fillable forms are here, just go to Google, put that in. Uh, it's still free for producers in Virginia. 
And also, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. It's my phone number and email as well. So, with that, um, I'm now moderator again. So, uh, do you have any questions for me? <laughs> we got about four minutes left. Yes. That's currently a question okay. being asked among many different agencies. Uh, I'm typically treating it as a fertilizer. Okay. I'm running fertilizer extractions on it down in Virginia. Uh, we're looking at water solubility. It's less soluble than poultry litter and inorganic fertilizers. So I don't think it's fair to treat it as a manure because it's less soluble than manure even. Um, I don't think it's fair to treat it even as a inorganic fertilizer as its current form because it's not as soluble as that either. So I think the question is we don't know really what we would call it yet. Okay. When I'm, I, send it, I send it to private labs for analysis, I, I run it as a manure and as a fertilizer and look at both numbers. So uh, what state are you in? Pennsylvania. Pens yeah, okay, I don't, know, I don't know a lot about Pennsylvania regulations, uh, but yeah. <laughs> I know, I know other states are, 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 are working on that issue, trying to figure out what to do. Yes, product, what's the potassium content of the ash? It depends on, basically the ash products, uh, it's, it's, it's based on what you put in, it's what you get out. It's six to seven times concentrated. So you think about poultry litter, it's typically a 033, you know, three times uh, six is 18% potash. So it's 15 to 20% potash. It's kind of a good generic. You know, if somebody clean out the house every year or every other year, like some producers are doing, they have these systems, it'll be lower, of course, you know, 12, 15. Uh, we work with litter as old as six years old, and that was like 21%. So kind of dependent. All right, any other questions? All right. Thank you all. Hopefully there's donuts out there. So. <laughs>